back to the Live Mind Podcast. On today's show, how moms and dads view each other's co-parents, co-parenting skills affect kids' behavior outcomes. A new test quickly identifies that patients are more hypnotizable. Short nighttime sleep linked with nearly doubled risk of clogged leg arteries. Oh no. And 10 signs, 10 scientifically proven signs that you are in love. Should be a good show. Let's get right into it. Welcome back to the Live Mind Podcast. Let's get right into this. First, how moms and dads view each other as co-parents affects kids' outcomes of behavior. In a study done by Ohio State University, how mothers and fathers see each other as co-parents of their children plays a key role in how well-adjusted their kids become. Researchers found that children have the best outcomes when both parents saw their co-parenting relationship as highly positive and worst when both parents viewed their relationship as poor. The best outcome for children was when both parents saw their co-parenting relationship as positive, but children were almost as well adjusted when the relationship quality was moderate and mothers were less positive about co-parenting relative to fathers. Child outcomes suffered more, or they suffered in general, when it was fathers who were less positive about co-parenting. Interesting. Co-parents with highly quality, with high quality relationships provide emotional support to one another and back up each other's parenting decisions. One question the study raises is why children are less well adjusted when fathers are less positive than mothers about their co-parenting relationship. Um, So it shows also that when mothers are less positive than fathers, this may indicate that mothers feel that fathers are not contributing enough to parenting. Given that it is common for mothers to feel that way, it may not lead to as much conflict between the parents as when fathers are less positive, which may be why the children are relatively well adjusted. Overall, the results suggest that practitioners who work with parents want to pay special attention when fathers are less positive than mothers about their co-parenting relationship. Conclusion, family therapy, we need to know if fathers are not happy in the relationship and work on building a cohesive bond around that. Very interesting. Next, a new test quickly identifies patients whose post-operative pain can be effectively treated by hypnosis. In a study by El Sevier, hypnosis is an effective treatment for pain for many individuals, but determine which patients will benefit most can be challenging. Hypnotizability testing requires special training and in-person evaluation rarely available in the clinical setting. Now investigators have developed a fast point of care molecular diagnostic test that identifies a subset of individuals who are most likely to benefit from hypnosis interventions for pain treatment. Prior research search <coughs> established that the genetic basis, <coughs> excuse me, I went for a long run last night and it's like, oh, I can still feel it. <coughs> Prior research search established that the genetic basis for hypnotizability includes four specific single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs or genetic variations. 
found in the catechol o methyl transferase or CMT gene, COMTG MT gene for an enzyme in the brain that is responsible for dopamine metabolism in the prefrontal cortex. Although SNPs can contain valuable information on disease risk and treatment response, widespread widespread use in clinical practice is limited because of its complexities. Okay. The study investigated the association between COMT gene, the catechol O methyl transferase gene, um, diplotypes, and hypnotizability using a clinical hypnotizability scale called the hypnotic induction profile, or the HIP, in individuals who had participated in one of the three previous clinical trials in which and HIP was administered. For participants identified with the optimal COMT diplotypes by the GMR biosensor array, um, scored highly on 89.5% scored highly on the HIP, which identified 40.5% of the treatable population. The optimal COMT group mean HIP score was significantly higher than that in the suboptimal COMT group. Interestingly, further analysis revealed that the difference was observed only in women. Ooh! Although we had expected some differences in effect between females and males, the association between hypnotizability and the COMT genotypes was strongest in the females in the cohort. The difference may be due to um, the COMT is known to have the COMT gene is known to have interactions with estrogen. The same optimal COMT individuals had significantly higher post-operative pain scores than the suboptimal group, indicating a greater need for the treatment. So conclusion, women, the study is suggesting women are more hypnotizable than men, and this could be linked to estrogen or higher levels of estrogen. So it looks like studies could also look into if higher levels of estrogen make an individual an individual more susceptible to hypnotizability. Next. Short nighttime sleep linked with nearly doubled risk of clogged leg arteries. In a study by the European Society of Cardiology, sleeping less than five hours a night is associated with a 74 74% raised likelihood of developing peripheral artery disease compared with seven to eight hours. The study included more than 650,000 participants and was conducted in two parts. First, the researchers an an analyzed, I was gonna say analyzed, analyzed the association of sleep duration and daytime napping with the risk of peripheral artery disease. In the second part, the investigators used genetic data to perform naturally randomized, randomized controlled trials. In an observational analysis of 53,416 adults, sleeping less than five hours a night was associated with nearly doubled risk of peripheral artery disease compared with seven to eight hours of sleep. Conclusion. That beauty rest means more than just some beauty. Get the, make sure that blood flows solid. So we need to make sure no matter what you have to do, get that eight hours or at least get seven minimum. Whoa. Next. 10 scientifically proven signs that you are in love. Oh, goodness. 
Number one, thinking that someone is special. When you're in love, you begin to think your beloved is unique. The belief is coupled with an inability to feel romantic passion for anyone else. According to a 2017 article um, in the journal Archives of Sexual Behavior, this monogamy results from elevated levels of central dopamine, a chemical involved in in attention, in attention and focus in your brain. All right, out, out the gate. Now, the one already tells you if someone is being, if someone's practicing infidelity in the relationship, they're probably not in love with you. Number two, focusing on the positive. People who are truly in love tend to focus on the positive qualities of their beloved while overlooking his or her negative traits. Self explanatory. Number three, emotional instability. As is well known, falling in love often leads to emotional and physiological instability. You bounce between exhilaration, euphoria, increased energy, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, trembling, a racing heart, and accelerated breathing, as well as anxiety, panic, and feelings of despair when your relationship suffers even the smallest setback. Whoa. When extreme, these mood swings parallel the behavior of drug addicts, according to a 2017 article in the the journal Philosophy, Psychiatry, and Psychology. And indeed, when in love, people are shown pictures of the loved ones, it fires up the same regions of the brain that activate when a drug addict takes a hit. According to Fisher, being in love is a form of addiction. And when this is taken away from someone, they can experience withdrawals and relapse. Yeah, we all know that's a fact. Number four, intensifying attraction. Going through some sort of adversity with another person tends to intensify romantic attraction with that person. According to Fisher's research, central dopamine may be responsible for this reaction too. Because research shows that when a reward is delayed, dopamine producing neurons in the midbrain region become more productive. So if you are looking to build a stronger bond with your intimate partner, you might want to start a project together and uh, make sure it's challenging. Number five, intrusive thinking. People who are in love report that they spend on average more than 85% of their waking hours musing over their love object. According to Fisher, intrusive thinking as this form of obsessive behavior is, um, is called may result from decreased levels of central serotonin in the brain, a condition that has been associated with obsessive behavior previously. According to a 2012 study, published in the Journal of Psychophysiology, men who are in love have lower serotonin levels than men who are not, while the opposite applies to women. The men and women who were in love were found to be thinking about their loved one for around 65% of the time they were awake. Oh, gosh, you're not getting nothing accomplished (laughs) when you're in deep love. That's all you're thinking about. Number six, emotional dependency. People in love regularly exhibit signs of emotional dependency on their relationship, including possessiveness, jealousy, fear of rejection, and separation anxiety. For instance, Fisher and her colleagues looked at the brains of individuals viewing photos of a rejected loved one or someone they were still in love with after being rejected by that person. The F or the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, fMRI, showed activation in several brain areas, including the four brain areas, like the singlet gyrus, that have been shown to play a role in cocaine cravings. Activation of areas involved in cocaine addiction may help explain 
the obsessive behaviors associated with rejection and love. Mm. <laughs> this thing is deep. Number seven, planning a future. I know I'm, I'm doing a lot right here. Forgive me. Planning a future, longing for emotional union with a beloved, seeking out ways to get closer and daydreaming about a future together are also signs of someone in love. According to an article by Harvard University, when serotonin levels begin to return to their normal levels, the hormone ex oxytocin increases in the body. This neurotransmitter is associated with creating more serious relationships. Yes, indeed. Uh, functional MRI studies show that primitive neural systems underlying drive, uh, reward, recognition, and euphoria are active in almost everyone when they look at the face of their beloved and think loving thoughts. This puts romantic love in the company of survival symptoms, systems like those that make us hungry or thirsty. I, um, I think of romantic love as part of the human reproductive strategy. It helps us form pair bonds, which help us survive. We were built to experience the magic of love and to be driven toward another. Also important to note, stress creates more desire for someone. And I think that goes back to um, the desire to reproduce. So if you feel like you're in stress or that things are going away and you're like, dang, I need to get some more kids out here before something happens to me. I think that's a natural tendency. So when you're under more stress, you're going to have more kids. <clears throat> Number eight, aligning interest. Falling in love can result in someone reordering their daily priorities to align with those of their beloved. While some people may attempt to be more like a loved one, Another official study presented in 2013 at the Being Human Conference found that people are attracted to their opposites, at least their brain chemical opposites. For instance, uh, the research found that people with so or her research found that people with so-called testosterone dominant personalities, highly analytical, competitive and emotionally contained, were often drawn to mates with personalities linked to high estrogen and oxytocin levels. These individuals tended to be empathetic, nurturing, trusting, and pro-social, and introspective, seeking meaning and identity. So there's two, two important factors on that. If your mate is not making time for you, they're probably not in love. <laughs> if they're in love with you, they're going to drop everything. To come hang out with you. Another thing is, it's best to be your authentic self because you will find the perfect mate for you instead of trying to put on a front or be a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, and then your mate doesn't truly match who you are. But if you're a very alpha, testosterone driven, competitive, aggressive, gotta be your way type of guy. You better be that all the way through and through. If you're more of a go with the flow, chill, relax, have fun, a little bit of estrogen dripped in there type of guy, be yourself so that your mate is, is compatible from the jump. Number nine, possessive feelings. Those who are deeply in love often experience sexual desire for their beloved but there are strong emotional strings attached. The longing for sex is coupled with the desire for sexual exclu exclusivity and extreme jealousy when the partner is suspected of infidelity. According to the, uh, the Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, oxytocin is released during sexual activity. This hormone, as mentioned above, creates social bonds and develops trust. This attachment is thought to have evolved so that an in love person will compel his or her partner to spurn other suitors or push away other suitors or other people, thereby ensuring that the couple's courtship is not interrupted until conception has occurred or until a baby has been born. 
makes sense. So let's be clear. If you if your mate is talking about um, Polly out the gate, they're probably not in love with you. They probably appreciate you, respect you, and love you as a a friend. But are they truly in love with you? You know, you know we're friends. So, 10, craving emotional union. While the desire for sexual union is important to, uh, to people in love, the craving of emotional union takes precedence. In the study in 2002, published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, they found that 64% of people in love disagreed with the statement, sex is the most important part of the relationship with my partner. And that's of both sexes. So it is agreed that males and females both want an emotional connection with their partner. So, fellas, you gotta, you, you definitely gotta get in there and get emotional. If you like that video, please like, comment, subscribe to see more. One love.